We're in uh, class number 19. And I'm going to run through some fundamentals very quickly just to, to get your thinking. But then I'm going to pivot on something here just to help you understand uh, the longevity of what we do and, and, and why sometimes it takes a long time to get to where we're going. Uh, and not many people get to where we want to go. And it's one of the problems of the, the church as a whole. And um, we, we want to remind you that this document that we have here in front of us is not a devotional. It is a legal manuscript. It is the legal manuscript of a country. It's the legal manuscript of, um, of a kingdom. And when you talk about God's optic, God doesn't deal with us through religion. God deals with us through citizenry. You have to understand that. And, and it's probably one of the weakest things we do as a church as a whole is we, we just become, you know, another religion. Uh, and we become Christian. But we're not Christian, per se. We are citizens of a country. And you've got to see yourself as a citizen because with that citizenry uh, it comes rights and privileges. Um, and it's all legal. The whole thing is a legal document. You have to remember that. In this legal document, it, is a, it was something that was bequeathed to us. Um, Jesus, who died and rose again, he died so that we could have, a, 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 we could become heirs a, of this resource, of this kingdom. And that was the whole reason he came and died. People say, well, he came and died so that I, my sins would be forgiven and I'd get to heaven. That's a side note. He came to restore what Adam lost. Adam didn't fall from heaven. Adam fell from earth. We weren't designed for heaven. We're designed for here. And Jesus came and died so that we could have back what Adam lost us, which was God's original intention and purpose for us being here on earth. It says here in Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto the Father who had made us partakers of this inheritance. And that's what this is. It's an inheritance. We inherited something. An inheritance of the saints of light whom he had delivered, sorry, who had delivered us from the power of darkness into the kingdom. Our, our inheritance is a kingdom. Not a ticket to heaven. Our inheritance is a kingdom and our ability to participate in it. I said this, the death of Jesus was vital in our redemption. It was the means to an end. The end was the inheritance of a kingdom. Please understand that. That's why he came. That's why he died, was to, to give us the, the, test, the, the testator has to die for us to become heirs. Then he rose again to make sure that we got it and knew how to enjoy it as well. But he had to die for something. He died so we'd have the kingdom. The end was the inheritance of a kingdom. The church preached the means, not the end. That's our problem. We're always talking about the door instead of the product that the door is a door to. He's the door to something. He's the way to something. He's the life of something. And we major around the means and we don't major on the product of what it was he came to give to us. The church preached the gospel of Jesus instead of the gospel that Jesus preached. Everybody says, you know, if Jesus said it, if Jesus done it, well, that's what we need to do. Preachers say, you know what, we've got to follow Jesus. Well, this is what Jesus did. He taught the gospel of the kingdom. It was the only message that Jesus taught. He didn't teach on healing. He didn't teach on prosperity. He didn't teach on any of that stuff. Because they are all inbuilt. They're inherent in the kingdom. They're in it. They come with it. We treat tithing and we treat healing and we treat all of these as, 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 as other products that we're looking or seeking God to give to us. God gave us the whole lot in the kingdom. And then he gave us the kingdom. So Jesus didn't teach on healing. He demonstrated the kingdom by healing. He demonstrated the provision of the kingdom by providing. But he taught the kingdom and then he manifested it in, in, in what he did. In Mark 1.14. Now after that, 
John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the gospel. What was the gospel? The kingdom is the gospel. If I asked you today, what's the gospel? Or I asked the church today, what's the gospel? They'll tell you, it's Jesus. Now, I understand Jesus is an inherent part of the gospel being provided to us. But the good news that was, was uh, uh, of the gospel is that what is here? The kingdom. You say, well, the good news is that Jesus came. No, that is good news, so don't get me wrong. And it's imperative that he came, otherwise we wouldn't get what we lost. But the gospel that he preached, he didn't preach about himself, he preached about what he came to give back to us. Jesus never preached himself public. He didn't preach about his death, burial, and resurrection publicly. He never did. He taught that to his disciples privately. Privately. He never stood in front of the crowd and said, you are going to kill me and I'm going to do it. He never did. Not once he never did it. Because that's not what he came to talk about. He didn't come to talk about what he was about to do. He came to talk about what he came to obtain for us. I told you this too, and I know it sucked all the oxygen out of the room, but Jesus only taught, you must be born again, how many times? And did he teach it in public? No. He, he taught it privately to one man. No. Do we need to get born again? Absolutely. It is the mannerism in which we, we, we inherit and get into uh, the citizenry of this kingdom. There's no doubt about that. But Jesus preached what? The kingdom. He is the means of getting into it, but you've got to show the product. And the product was the kingdom. And so this is all he taught. It says, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then he demonstrated it. I don't know why he did that. And it came to pass afterwards that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings. What are glad tidings? Which is? Or the gospel. So what's the gospel? Jesus told, this was the gospel. He said, preaching and showing the good tidings, the good, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And the people, when they knew it, they followed him and he received them and he spake unto them of the kingdom of God. And then again demonstrated it. It was a byproduct of it. Luke 10. And into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you, heal the sick, that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom's here. Everything else was a byproduct of it. And when it was the days that he was departed into a desert place, the people sought him, and he came unto them, and that he would come unto them and stay with them, and that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I, I have to go and preach the kingdom of God to other cities. That's the reason I was sent. You see, Jesus was sent to die, and to... Yeah, he was sent to reestablish the kingdom. His death, burial, and resurrection was part of the process of that. And after that manner, they, when he said, when you pray, here's how you pray. You pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. He said, that's what you pray for. You want to know what your prayers need to be directed to God about? Kingdom. He said, it's the, the, the priority of your life. It's to seek it. It's to look for it. To obtain it. Paul the Apostle. And when they had appointed him a day, they came on to, a many on to him in his lodging. This when he was in house arrest in Rome. These are the last things Paul was doing. And he expounded on to them and testified of what? That's what Paul was doing. He was testifying of the king and persuading them then concerning Jesus. Both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening, you thought we were bad for an hour. He spent all day talking to them about the kingdom and then explaining how it worked by teaching them about Jesus. They preached the kingdom 
and they taught about Jesus. There's a big difference. Big difference. When you preach, the public proclamation was about what? The kingdom. And then he taught about who? We proclaim Jesus and then we don't teach anything else. He proclaimed the kingdom, the product. And then when they wanted the product then, and, and, and wanted to get into it, then he shared with them about Jesus. We run out sh telling everybody about Jesus and the blood and the cross and everything, and we never get to the product. We never do. And we wonder why people don't want it. Because we tell them it's something in the great by and by in the sky when you die, instead of something you can have right now. In Acts 20, last few verses, or 28, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Flipped it the whole way around. He preached the kingdom and he taught about Jesus. But the kingdom came first. Then he explained why Jesus and how Jesus fitted into us having it and obtaining it. But the kingdom was the product. And I just said this last week, and I want to just, I need to get to this so I can flip, pivot here. Now I say unto you that an heir, as long as he is a child, he differs nothing from a servant, although he's Lord of all. As long as we are childish to our heirship, we are no better than a servant. If we don't understand what we have, if we don't get it, and we just carry on as believers, but childish-like, we're no better than a servant. We're no better than a servant. And, and we're not servants. I know your religious mind just said, oh, excuse me, we, no, we're not. We're sons and heirs. Jesus said in, in, in John's Gospel, he said, now I call you friends. Do you remember that portion, John 16? He says, I call you friends and not servants. And then he explained why. Because a servant knows not what his master doeth. But you are my friends and therefore you'll know now everything that I'm doing. There's a difference. And he says, as long as you're childish about you, what you're an heir to, you're, you're no better than a servant. Even though you have, you have, you have access to it all, you, you, you'll never walk in it. And then he goes on to talk about um, even so, because of our childishness, we become bonded, in bondage to the elements around us. Because we don't, don't know any better. And then he goes on to say, but the whole reason that he gave us the Holy Ghost was so that he would reveal to us what we have. You see, the Holy Ghost was given to us, you know, to be spooky and bizarre. He wasn't. He was given to us to lead us, teach us, and guide us into the revelation of what we have as heirs and co-heirs in Christ. Which is kingdom. kingdom. The gospel has become the work that Jesus did and not why he did it. The gospel for many has become the work that Jesus did but not the why. And so we major, we go from week to week, singing songs about what he did. You know, you, 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 eventually you, you, know, you get tired of singing the one song to the one person and whatever, and, and, and you have to come up with a new one. And this, I'm not saying he's not worthy of praise, and he's not worthy of adoration, and he's not worthy uh, of, of, um, of the position that he holds. But you've got to ask the why as well. Why did he do what he done? And so the gospel has become, for the church, the gospel of what Jesus did, and not the gospel of why Jesus did it. And because we don't understand that, we miss the potency of what it is we have. We're still childish as heirs, and we might as well be nothing greater than a servant. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Now let me flip into this. There are three things that are necessary, and the scriptures are 
spent a lot of time in, in, in helping us to develop this. The order of process is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Proverbs 4, 4 7, um, uh, Solomon says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But in all your getting, get understanding. Three aspects. Wisdom is the practical application, the last one there. It's the application of the Word of God in your life. The information is in the book that's sitting before you, that manuscript, which is your constitutional right. That is the knowledge. In order to get that knowledge and be able to apply it to our life, you've got to have the middle thing called understanding. Understanding is comprehension. You've got to be able to comprehend it. What you have in front of you, what you have that we, we call the Bible, is a legal manuscript, the constitution of a country. We sit to gain knowledge of it so that we might, by being taught, gain comprehension of it so that with that comprehension we can apply it. Remember we talked about law, authority, and power. You've got to have the law because without the law you have nothing to have authority of. And without having authority you have nothing to enforce with power. It's just it's the way it works. So I, in doing this, I wanted to bring you over to a portion of Scripture over in Matthew 13, where Jesus was always teaching in parables. Did you ever notice that? Always teaching in parables. It says in Matthew 13, he's after teaching the parable of the sower and a whole bunch of different things, and, and most people go, yeah, yeah, very, very deep. And they were sort of walking away, and later on the disciples came and said, what was that all about? And he explains what that's about. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? What's with the stories, Jesus? What's with all of the little stories? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's, it's not. To them it is not given. He says, you can understand it, and we need this understanding, but those others don't understand it. That's why I speak to them in parables. Sounds strange, doesn't it? I, I'm telling them, but I, they don't understand it. And now I'm explaining it to you. I'm telling you how it works. I'm now taking you aside to instruct you how this works. But they don't understand what I just said. But you will. I'm showing you how this works. But they don't get it. But you will. Now it sounds strange that he would do that. But it's not. It's perfectly understandable if you understand God. And there's a reason behind it. And sometimes we look and say, well, why did we go 19 weeks? We got 19 hours on money and he didn't even mention the dollar yet. We're getting there. But not everybody will get there. Not everybody gets there, should I say. And I'll explain why. Jesus taught parabolic. Okay? Hide the truth until the people are ready and want to receive it. You hide it until the people are ready and they want to receive it you've got to want to receive it it's hidden enough to cause you to want to, to want to come and look for it you all with me he told the stories of the kingdom in such a way that it wasn't obvious to the casual hearer but for anybody who really wanted to know and would search for it dig for it, want to know it, it could be known. But not to the casual, not to the casual passerby. Parabolic teaching is to hide the truth until the people are ready and want to receive it. It's a principle that is based on the premise that nothing is yours until you discover it. You can't live on my revelation. Well, Hassan said, never mind what I said. 
You have to get it for you. The principle of this premise or, or is or based on the premise that nothing is yours until you find it, till you get it. It's not suffice to say he has it. It's no good to you if I have it. It's only good to you when you get it. You can talk about the steak and the potatoes and the red wine until we eat the meal and have it inside us. You're just talking about something. It's just on a menu. It's just a menu. You just open the book and you read the menu, but you haven't tasted it. The premise here is that nothing is yours until you discover it. Let me move on. It doesn't matter how much your teacher knows. It'll never be yours until you discover it. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter how much I know. It doesn't matter. It only matters when you come to know it, when you find it for you, when you discover it. It's hidden until the listeners are ready to discover it. Jesus spoke in parables and he put it out there. He taught them about the kingdom, but in such a way that it was truth, but they had to look for it and they had to want to know it. And in the wanting to know it and the looking for it, it would be revealed or understood, but the casual observance would not do it. You had to want to know it. And the reason he does that is because it's not yours until you discover it. I can share what I've discovered, but it's not yours until you discover the same thing. Then it becomes yours. Because you want it. Not because I said it, but because you want it. Does this make sense? See, a lot of times when we go to church, what we do is we want to go in and, and, and hear a two-part, three-part series, or we want to go in and hear an edifying, encouraging word uh, on, a, uh, on, on, a, on a Sunday morning, and then we walk out and say, oh, that was great, I was very encouraged, I was, in, I was inspiring. You can, you can only... No, I'm going to say that. You... you, you what they share with you is not yours until you get it yourself. You have to want to get it yourself. I mean, the job of a preacher is not to teach you something. It's to get you curious enough to dig it out yourself. Correct. You can only inspire what they already have. If they don't have it, you can't inspire it. They don't know what to do with it. And what we do is we don't hunger enough. We don't want it enough. Give me five points and that'll do it. Tell me how to be rich quick. Get to the money thing if, you're, if you don't mind. We are getting to it. But if you don't understand the kingdom and that God is going to, when he talks about money, is going to see it through that optic, you won't get it. You won't get it. Most people don't even want to search for it enough. It takes a unique bunch of people to press into what God is doing because they want to know. We spent the last 19 hours wanting to know. Still with me? And I can tell you all that I know about money, but you won't get it until you discover it yourself. And it's, it comes with a kingdom optic. So let me explain this. In Proverbs 25 and verse 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's the honor of a king to search out the matter. We're all kings. We're a, we're a kingdom of kings and priests. It's God's prerogative to, to hide it, but it's our privilege to find it. God's not hiding it from us. He's hiding it for us. He's not hiding it from us. When he shared those parables, he wasn't hiding the truth from them. He was hiding it for those who wanted to know it. Wasn't hiding it from them. He was hiding it for them. Which meant the ones who wanted it got it. And there's a reason for that too, and I'll get to it. Sir. So I just wanted to point out a potential 
blocker for, for the room that, you know, all of our lives, especially if you're born in this country, and if you relate to the thought of a king, that's bad. You got away from the king in this country. That's what we're all about. And to be under authority, that's bad too, right? It's infringing on my freedoms. And so we have this culturally ingrained concept of, of, of basically bowing down to a king for the benefits of the kingdom that we inherited as heirs, but it's almost like in our brains, it's, you know, in my case, you know, five decades of contrary layers ingrained that you have to constantly peel back these layers in order to, to open yourself up to that. And um, as we've been talking, you know, um, I think about that. I think that, you know, I can't be the only person that has that kind of blocker in my brain that I'm, that I'm working through mm -hmm. constantly. And I uh, just want to really kind of share that thought to the group because I think it is a blocker for us to be able to to receive. I got I had mentioned to you um, that uh, you know when God will give us what we can then prosper for him in in, uh, in our journey and our purpose fulfilling our purpose. And uh, you know it's like okay well if he starts to if he starts to give to me am I really ready? Am I really ready to receive? Right, and and that's something that I I think about. Hopefully, that's a good sign that I think that way. But that's something I think about, and, and these are some of the, some of the, the hurdles mentally I feel myself going through. Okay, and uh, the the safest place and the greatest place to be in life is under authority. The greatest and the safest place to be in life is under authority and yet we oppose it all the time we're taught in our generation we don't trust authority we're afraid of authority we think if we get authority that we'll be abused it's not true it is true of the way the world is but remember the centurion came to Jesus and he said I'm a man under authority like you are and then he says you don't have to take, come he said you just say go and go and I you I know how it works you know how it works and and Jesus said, I have not found anybody even in Israel. This guy was a Gentile. He said, this guy knows how it works. It's all about authority. But I can't teach you on authority until I've explained the kingdom. But you're absolutely right. There is a pushback. You were going to say something? Yeah. If you zoom out to the 30,000 foot, if you look at programmatically, why would man's society want to teach us only how? only kings that we're taught are the bad kings. We're not taught about a real true king that can have dominion on this earth. We're taught heaven somewhere else, not heaven on earth. We're taught about kings only in a God in a manly sense, but not in a divine sense mm -hmm. that's with us here. So through generations, it's just been passed down. It's almost a lie of omission. The lie of omission is we're taught the kings that we're supposed to rebel because we don't want to have a king and another man telling us what to do, and his army to tell us what to do, but we've never been taught the kingdom the way you taught us the kingdom. And so the word king, we have this sort of programmatically trained in rebellion to that word because we haven't been taught properly. Yes. Fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah, but we'll we, we, we get the right optic. We'll we get it right. God hides it, not from us. But we all understand that yeah. there Yes. Being part of a country or yeah. But then that, we that's yeah. clear to us. Yeah. Right. We said when you ask someone how many of your sins are forgiven, they'll say all. Oh. Mm. And they say, How come you're on your knees every day asking them to forgive your sins? Yeah. Same thing. We talked about in, in this series about governance is the greatest uh, desire of all humanity, finding good governance. And we and we come up with all sorts of governances under sin. 
What we're really looking for is this, the kingdom. That's really what man's... And, and Jesus, remember we brought this up a few weeks ago? Jesus said the violent take it by force. As soon as they find out what it is, they'll force their way into it. But they haven't been taught what it is. We haven't been preaching the kingdom. We've been preaching the means to it. But we haven't been preaching the product. So all I'm trying to show you here is that there are some things that are there, but you, they're not yours until you find them. You have to look for them. It's a casual... Coming to a Bible study is not going to do it. You have to want it. It, it, it. There's a different process. Jeremiah 29, 11. You're all familiar with it. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me, and you will find me when? When? When, when you're committed to finding him, not because you went to church on a Sunday morning and said, God needs to speak to me. You, if you don't have the heart to look for it and want it enough, you're not going to get it. You have to discover it. You have to want it. Have you ever gone to a service where, where you, you walk out at the end and somebody says, boy, I got loads out of that. And the other fellow says, I got nothing out of it. What was that all about? I thought that was the best message ever. And the other one says, I got nothing out of it. They both heard the same thing. Receptivities were different. One was wanting something. One was wanting to hear from. And the other just, he was, have you got anything from there? And nothing there interests me. Same message. Why did one get something and the other one didn't? Because one was looking for something. And this is what God does. You have, to, you have to be all in. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith it's impossible to please God. For them that come to him must. This is, this is a criteria. A lot of people think, well, if I just come to God in the name of Jesus, that's it. It's not it. The onus is on you and I to be in faith, to believe and to expect. But, but we put the onus back on God. Well, I prayed... I said in the name of Jesus. I give, an, I give an offering. It's up to God. It's not up to God. It was never up to God. It's always up to us. Our, our inability to, to, to want this stuff enough. We treat the kingdom so casually. Casual. It's not the priority of our lives. I know we think, we, we think it is, but it's not. It's not. We can take it or leave it. You can go for weeks without pressing into it. And then we think we're serious about God. He said, no, this is really for the serious people. Not everybody's going to get this. Only the serious people are going to get it. It's not that it's not for everybody. It's for everybody. But we've become so... Just give me the five points. Is that it? They're the five? Well, I've done two of them. I've only three more to do. And bingo. You know? All cherries, cherry, 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 cherry. Oh, I won! Doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work because you sat and heard it. It only works when you dig for it enough and you understand it for you. That's when it works for you. Not because I said it, but because you understand it. The teacher does not determine the lesson but the student's capacity and the desire to know does. Does that make sense? The teacher does not determine the lesson. I don't determine the lesson. Who determines the lesson? I'll try that again. I don't determine where we go with this lesson. Who does? You do. I call it, I have a name for it. What's the name I have for it? A rabbit hole. How many rabbit holes do we go down when we start a series? Because I'm not teaching the lesson that I want to teach you I'm teaching the lesson that you want taught. The student is ready, the teacher appears. 
I don't determine the lesson, you do. The teacher does not determine the lesson, but the student's capacity and the desire to know does. Can you see that again? Now that you, now that you have me thinking, um, I have, I, can I say something? Yes, what would you like to say? Can I say something? Yes, what would you like to say? I, you know, I, I get it very hard. I get that. Something we need to deal with. Who's the, dictating the lesson? Who's dictating the lesson? The student. the student. When Jesus taught, he only taught them what they had the capacity and the desire to know. If you don't want to know it, we're not going there. When you arrive on a Sunday, if all you want is a, a fulfill your religious rhetoric, that's all you're going to get. That's as deep as it goes. Because the lesson is not determined by the teacher. The lesson is truly determined by the capacity and the desire of the student to know something. So it's based on the hunger of the student, not on the knowledge of the teacher. Does that make sense? The reason we're 19 weeks into this series on money is because of the, the, the desire and our endeavor to bring the capacity of the student to a place where they can grasp the kingdom and God's optic of money. <laughs> right, well, I'll let that one write. I'll let that one run on its own. Maybe just, All right. Maybe just us a <laughs> now, let, let me explain this to you. God had to teach. Jesus had to teach this way. He had to teach at the level of the capacity and the understanding of the student that he was teaching. He had to for integrity and holiness sake. If he was to maintain his integrity, his uprightness and correctness and holiness, he had to do it that way. Let me explain. If God was to give you something that he presumed, he presumed or knew that you needed without you asking for it, or even realizing that you have a need for it, he would have imposed himself into your situation. Let me say that again. Think about this. If God were to give you something that he presumed and knew, or knew, that you had need of it, and without you asking for it, he give it to you, or even realizing that you had a need for it, he would have imposed himself on your situation. Does that make sense to you? I'll say it again. If God was to give you something that he presumed or knew that you needed, but you didn't ask him for it, in fact, you didn't even know you needed it, but he turned around and gave it to you, he would have imposed himself on you. Uh, totally. There would be no free will in it. He, he knew you needed it. He presumed you needed it. And therefore he gave it to you. But you didn't even know you needed it. And you didn't even ask for it. But he gave it to you. He has now imposed himself into your situation. He doesn't use force. Of course. Sorry. Again, you can only... Um, you say when they ask, they well, don't. Like if you're caught up in the world, you're asking for these worldly things that you truly don't need, but you're skipping the biblical principles and the things that you actually need. Mm -hmm. Then you're not using the principles. There's a whole lot. Or you're just kind of learning through failure to learn. Come over here and not be listening. Well, you think we would learn. 
um, through failure and do it, but we don't. We keep doing the whole thing, and it's like a lottery. We just some days it works, and then when it does work, we don't know why it worked, but hey, it worked. So I'll keep going again for the next 10 years. It might work again. So I keep rubbing the lamp in the name of Jesus and hope the genie comes out and answers that. It's not the way it works. It's not supposed to work that way. Well, well don't some people need to just get more and more and more and more and more stuff until all of a sudden all the stuff in the world wears off and has no meaning to them? They get to the end of the road and they go, I didn't need to get that in the first place. It was part of their journey because they just for had some. to figure out that my 17th Lambo is not going to make me happy. I don't need anything else. I need something. If you're going to arrive at that solution before you spend all that time, yes, it would. But you're right. People get there, and, and, and we're going to talk about that. Yes, sir. The, uh, yeah, yeah, being th we're maybe I'm gonna explain. It. We're we're all we're running around this thing, and and I, I you're all of you are right from your perspective of what you're saying, but I, I don't want you to miss what I'm saying. If God, on the presumption of knowing that you need something, that you don't yet know you need and you haven't asked for. If he turns around and gives that to you without you asking for it or without you even knowing that you had a need of it, he would have imposed himself upon you. He wants you to want it. He wants you to get it yourself. He knows you need it, so he'll tell you it's available, but he won't give it to you until you come looking for it yourself. When the student desires to know or to understand or to gain it or get it, that's when it works. So God doesn't say, here, here it is. Because you take it at face value, but you wouldn't understand what it was you took or why you took it. Because you didn't even know you needed it, but you just took it because it was going for free. He said, no, that's not the way we do it. I'm not going to impose myself on you. I know you have need of it, but I'm going to give you enough information for you to want to want it. Then when you ask me for it, I can give it to you, but I can't impose it upon you. Yes. Yes. And for him to do it because he's God and to do it for us without us knowing we had a need and requesting it, it would be an imposition on his behalf to do it. And his holiness and integrity will not allow him to impose himself on us. So when he taught the kingdom, he hid it in a story so that only the ones who really wanted to know would find it. You have to want to know it. You have to want to get it. And for so many believers, they don't want to dig enough. They just don't. They want to hand it to them, but they don't want to find out their need for it, and then they don't want to pursue the desire to obtain it. Yeah, well, the point I'm trying to make here is that God, in his integrity, in his holiness, cannot and will not impose himself on your free will. So he doesn't give you what he knows you need, and he doesn't impose it upon you because he understands you have to have it, but he will put it out there so that you can see it. And if you really look for it, you'll find it. And when you find it and want it, if you ask him, he'll give it to you. No reservation. He'll give it to you. He wants you to have it, but you have to want to want it. Is this, this might be complicated. Your message earlier about kingdom and Jesus. But he gave us Jesus on earth. We 
we still have to seek him out. He didn't say everyone has to take Jesus or accept him. Sure, sure, sure. but he, he gives us the information, and then we have to want it. Man has to want it, otherwise God's imposing himself. But can you, can you explain how this concept compares with the concept of um, worry in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you know, he closed the birds and the fields, uh -huh. you should worry about those things because your Father will provide them for you. Good question. I'm getting to it. <laughs> He would have violated his integrity by giving you something you were not aware of or sought or requested. He knows what we need. He knows it. But he wants you to know you need it. When you and I know we need it and come to him for it, he says, yes, you can have it. Not because I have it to give it to you, but because you realized you needed it and now you have afforded me not, not to override my integrity or holiness because I treat everybody the same, but here it is, but you've got to want it. When you ask me for it, you'll get it. He knows you need it, but he's not going to impose it on you. You have to look for it, and when you, when you find the need for it and request it, you get it. Let me point this out to you in the scriptures. Be not ye therefore like unto them, your father knows you have need of them before you ask him. Did you know that God knows what you need before you ask him? It? But he still sits and lets you ask. Why would he let you ask even though he knows what you need? Because he wants you to know what you need. And he wants you to ask for it. Not because I said it, because you discovered you had the need and you discovered he had the answer. And then you came looking for it and God said, fine, there it is. His integrity remains intact. The truth is still there, but it's only for the ones who want it. It's only for the ones who want to know. Are you all with me? The penny will drop eventually. It'll, we'll get there. Matthew six thirty one. Therefore take no thought, saying... What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He knows you do. But here's what he'd love you to do. Go seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And when you go looking for the kingdom, all that other stuff that they're looking for, you'll get it. It's hidden in the kingdom. It's all part of the kingdom. It's not separate from it. It's part of it. But you've got to look for, not the things, you've got to look for what? The kingdom. the kingdom. So you've got to seek it. He says, seek ye first. Priority. Here's the, here's the truth, guys. The kingdom is not the priority for most believers. Priority means the most important thing. The thing that you value the most. You know, you give yourself to what you value the most. You give your time and your money and your effort and your energies to the things that's the most important to you. You throw an hour or two at the gospel a week. You throw a few bob in the kitty, a few dollars, and say, there you go, that'll keep them all going. And you spend more money on a meal or more time watching the football, and you say, God is the most important thing in my life. Come on, guys. He said, but you're supposed to seek the kingdom. It's supposed to be the priority of your life. The truth is, we don't want to know enough. We're not hungry enough. We don't want to know. We just want a casual, you know, God's in my life, somebody to give me solace and comfort and a devotional book when I need it. We're, we're totally approaching the whole thing wrong. We're approaching it, we're approaching it passively. Not you guys. Some of you now have sat here for 19 hours. <laughs> 19 hours waiting for something. But I didn't determine the route that we go. You did. Because I had to explain some stuff so that you'd see God's optic on money. 
and, and we're still getting there. How many of you have seen things differently in the last 19 hours than you did before you sat here? All right. That wasn't my doing. That was your doing. Seeking to know and to understand. And, and it's that desire that drives it. Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came unto him and says, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said, Because it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not. I'll explain this to you next week. The reason he said you get to know it is because they all give up something. They all wanted what he had. They wanted to know. At one stage they said, you know, we've given up mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, lands. We've given up something. We've, we, it's cost us. We've, we've given into it. We've, we've given our time. We've given up our trade for some of them. We've given up our families. We've given up stuff for it. We've given to it. And he goes, yeah. And that urgency and that, that, that desire for it is obvious because it becomes the priority of your time, of your resource, of your study. It becomes front and center of your life. And we wonder why it doesn't work or we wonder why we don't know. It takes time to get to know stuff. Can you imagine me trying to explain to you what you now know today in a one-hour class on money when we started this? You just wouldn't get it. When we started to talk about money, you would not see God's optic of the kingdom or of law or of constitution or of rights or of privilege or of inheritance. You wouldn't have seen it. But you do not. Are you all with me? And it's because we've labored to know. You have to want it. You have to put it front and center. It has to be the most important thing in your life. He said, they don't get it, but you will get it. You will get it because you want it. Yes, sir? This was really helpful as I was sitting with my kids this week. My daughter goes to King's Ridge and, you know, it's a fine school and all this, but they constantly talk about Yes, I totally agree. Um, I, I would encourage you, just press for it. And I'm not talking about a casualness. I'm talking about, you know, I, I, I'm not just saying this because they said it. You need to invest in it. You genuinely do. You genuinely need to, it, this needs to be a priority. If this, life, if this is changing your life, you need to invest in it. Because you're not investing in, in uh, in a ministry per se, you're investing in yourself. You can't get revelation unless you invest. Correct. It should be the priority of your life. It should be the most important thing. And if you want to see what, if you're really getting it, Joe, try and explain it to your wife. She'll let you know what you're doing. <laughs> hey, I have wives that come along and say, I'm making sure that he always goes to that study because of the change yeah. in his life. But that's the point. When you start to <laughs> yeah, I know. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry for the, the length of it, but I, I hope there's enough there to keep you thinking then. You've got to want this thing. And for those who do, God's only too willing to give it to you. He really wants you to get it, but you've got to want it. That's where the key is.